you know, we've been doing literally the same thing related to the thyroid, you know, since Theodore Coker got a Nobel Prize for changing the way we do this in the early 1900s. And literally right. not much has changed. Literally, it doesn't make sense that we have so much explosion of, of change in, in medicine in so many other areas. But in this area, we don't really have that much. Uh, you know, I did a lot of thyroid surgery for large symptomatic goiters and, uh, and even thyroid surgery for hot nodules. And I realized, you know, there are a lot of risks to thyroid surgery. There's many patients that have had 12 thyroidectomy for often low risk thyroid cancers suffering dramatically from the treatment, not from the mm. actual thyroid cancer. When I came across RFA, I realized like this is something that we have to bring to Canada. Welcome to Save Your Thyroid, a podcast all about thyroid nodules. My name is Jennifer Holcomb, and I advocate for fellow patients suffering with this very common condition. Thyroid nodules impact 70% of adults in their lifetime, and the standard of care is surgical removal of half or all of the gland. But in recent years, safe and effective non-surgical treatment options have become available. In this podcast, I sit down with patients and physicians to discuss life with thyroid nodules, treatment options, and how to save the thyroid whenever possible. Today's guest is Dr. Jesse Pasternak, an academic surgeon and patient advocate. He is the Chief of Endocrine Surgery in the Division of General Surgery at the University Health Network and Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. His career's focus is to use up-to-date data to push innovation in the treatment of surgical endocrinology. He is the only surgeon in Canada performing scarless thyroid surgery and was the first to start radiofrequency ablation of thyroid nodules. He is chair of the research committee at the American Thyroid Association and currently runs a trial to treat small thyroid cancers with RFA. He hopes to gain an understanding for thyroid cancer outcomes, but likely more importantly, the effect of treatment and cancer worry on quality of life and survivorship. He has three young kids, all of whom learned where the thyroid was before mastering the head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Dr. Pasternak, welcome to the podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Really, uh, really honored to be on. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's going to be, I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm honored to have you on, you know, as the physician who is credited with bringing RFA to Canada, you're kind of a big deal. But before we get into that discussion, tell me a little bit about your background, how you ended up in this career path of endocrine surgeon. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I love talking about it because it, uh, it starts off, you know, I wanted to be an endocrinologist when I started med school and um, I thought it was so fun and uh, I love like the intricacies and the difficult problems and the pathways and all that stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, some versions of the story uh, make me say that uh, I'm not cool enough to be an endocrinologist. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, the surgeons took me in, I became a surgeon, but I knew that there, that I definitely did want, did not want to give up that part of my, so uh, I found that there's a specialty called endocrine surgery, which literally was made for me. And, um, uh, and I became a surgeon while also being an endocrinology kind of, um, not, not necessarily expert, but just something that I like to do, um, mm. as my, as my job. So, so I got to do both and, uh, and it's so awesome because you can do so much, uh, in, uh, in your specialty. Um, and that's so wide ranging. I do, you know, one, one minute I'm, I'm a radiologist and I'm doing an ultrasound. The other minute I'm an internist and I'm, uh, I'm prescribing medications that change the hormone imbalances. Uh, and the other minute I'm a surgeon and I'm taking out, um, you know, a thyroid or a, or a parathyroid or an adrenal gland. So it's a pretty cool specialty. Um, and, uh, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. That's awesome. And there's so many things that you're doing that it never gets boring, I'm sure. Um, and, and of course I love to ask this question to surgeons because you're cutting into people, you're doing surgery, right? But what piqued your interest in RFA, a non-surgical procedure as a surgeon? That's a good question. I mean, I think the whole idea behind endocrine surgery is to try and make your what you're doing uh, in the best interest of the patient. You want the patient's uh, treatment to match the patient problem. Uh, whenever you do anything uh, in medicine, there's always risks and benefits. So on one hand, there is a risk um, 
of doing, you know, sometimes we have, we, we talk about risks of doing surveillance or nothing. Uh, there's risks for that. Uh, there's risks of doing surgery on the other end of the spectrum. Um, but there's benefits as well of doing surveillance or nothing or, uh, or benefits of doing surgery. And I think we really need to match those two. And the problem is that that medicine in general is very slow moving and there's a lot of kind of roadblocks to innovation, um, yeah. mostly related to, uh, you know, institutional norms and the way that mm -hmm. everybody else does things. And, uh, and, you know, personally, I, I think that that is, uh, why surgery or at least endocrine surgery is so ripe for change because, you know, we've been doing literally the same thing related to the thyroid, you know, since Theodore Coker, got a Nobel Prize for changing the way we do this in the early 1900s. And literally right. not much has changed. Maybe we've changed the size of the incision in some practices, but still in many mm -hmm. practices, it's not changed. Um, we've not changed the way that we dissect the recurrent nerve and dissect the thyroid. So literally, that, it doesn't make sense that we have so much explosion of, of change in, in medicine in so many other areas. But in this area, we don't really have that much change. And so that's why, at least for me, uh, it was also a great specialty to go into because there's so much uh, that you can actually match that, uh, getting back to it, match that, you know, problem that the patient has with a solution. An RFA is so different from, you know, any of the things that patients talk about with management of thyroid disease. It's so different. And so what I really want to get into today with you is how you brought this to Canada, particularly to your own practice. What was that process like? Because I know you know, here in the States, we have a different healthcare system than you do up in Canada. And so if you could kind of shed a little light on that, because I'm sure there was, as you were saying, there was some more resistance you had to deal with bringing that into your healthcare system. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I trained in the U.S. as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I did my endocrine surgery fellowship in San Francisco. So I know a little bit about American and I did my, uh, my master's degree in, in the U.S. as well. So I know I have some training in the U.S. So I know how the American system kind of works perfectly. Um, uh, and and it is it, it does have some similar roadblocks. From an okay. RFA perspective, what I would say personally is that, uh, you know, I did a lot of thyroid surgery for large symptomatic goiters and, mm -hmm. uh, and even thyroid surgery for hot nodules. And I, um, I did that in training and then in the early part of my practice. And I realized, you know, there are a lot of risks to thyroid surgery. And if, patient, if patients are having like, you know, some, some issues with, you know, a big thyroid pushing out of their neck or, uh, you know, even a hot nodule, th these, are, these are problems that, that it doesn't really make sense to make a huge cut in somebody's neck and rip mm -hmm. out their thyroid, have them ha hypothyroid for the rest of their life potentially. Um, mm -hmm. You know, have recurrent nerve palsies potentially to change their voice. Problems with their um, with their with their parathyroid glands and calcium. Uh, you know, calcium. Uh, we have a, a parathyroid transplant program here because there's many patients that have had total thyroidectomy for often mm -hmm. low risk thyroid cancers, both in the U.S. and Canada, that are st uh, suffering dramatically from the treatment, not from the mm -hmm. actual thyroid cancer. So. So I think, you know, I realized that there must be a better way. And then when I when I came across RFA, which was uh, in the late um, 2010s, probably 2018, right when it first came to the U.S., um, I saw this, uh, this and I, I, I've been reading reports of this in the past, uh, but I didn't really think that it was something that, we, that would actually be accepted in, in, in North America. But uh, over the course of the last kind of uh, five, six years, when I first started seeing it uh, come to, to North America, I realized, like, this is something that we have to bring to Canada. And so I, uh, I organized, uh, you know, with uh, certain you know, stakeholders to try to get it to Canada. We obviously we hit uh, COVID. So uh, trying to get it through Health Canada, which is the FDA of Canada, was almost impossible for a few years. Um, everything yeah. was stopped that was not related to COVID uh, innovation. So uh, basically, we had to just delay and I was just, you know, helping tighten up some of the submissions. We finally got it submitted and then we got it uh, approved. Um, and interestingly, I actually tried to fast track the approval by getting my thyroid RFA study uh, for thyroid cancers going, because I'll talk about thyroid cancer, it's a long discussion in a second, but, but basically the regulatory process uh, allowed mm -hmm. our thyroid cancer project to go ahead, essentially at the same time that it, it, it allowed the RFA probe to be uh, allowed. So, so we, wow. had, we actually got it both together and that was about a year, just over a year ago. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so I've been doing it for over a year and, uh, and, you know, it's just been a been a life changer for many patients for sure. Absolutely. You know, we started the, the Save Your Thyroid community in 2019 in, in, um, the summer of 2019, shortly after I had my procedure and, um, I connected with another patient who had 
uh, actually gone overseas and then been treated in the U.S. just after had been brought over here. And um, we were just passionate about sharing this information with other patients because it was so hard to find information. And in those beginning times, until RFA was available in Canada, we had so many Canadians that were asking, you know, where can I go for treatment? And a lot of them were coming to the U.S., some of them even going overseas. And so the day that I found out that RFA had been brought to Canada, I posted about that in the group, and you would not believe the number of happy Canadians. There was a lot of rejoicing. <laughs> so, um yeah. I mean, it's funny that you say that because, you know, I part of the submission that I've been trying to get, like, you know, funding, certain types of funding and stuff like that are from patient uh, work. Uh, you know, one of the Save Your Thyroid uh, petitions online had like 10,000 signatories even before we, we submitted the application to the Health Canada. So, yeah, I, I mean, it really, you know, people think that, you know, their advocacy doesn't it may not do as much as they hope, but definitely uh it definitely helps at least you know for people like me that are trying to like push up against the the slow moving glacial uh you know healthcare system uh it really helps us uh to some degree and it, you know obviously we haven't pushed as we haven't gotten the results that we have especially when it comes to funding and those kinds of things but but definitely um definitely we we've been able to change a bunch of stuff and people have people have you know been, been benefiting from that for sure thanks so much for watching this episode i hope you're enjoying it you know, this podcast requires a lot of my time, effort, and resources, but it is a labor of love. If you'd like to directly support my work here, you can do so in two different ways. You can purchase products from one of my affiliate brands, or if you would prefer to make a donation directly to the podcast, you can do that as well. Links to do either are located in the description below. Every dollar contributed goes right back into this podcast. Additionally, if you'd like to support the Save Your Thyroid patient advocacy community, which is working toward becoming a nonprofit organization, you can donate via our fiscal sponsor, Thyca, Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association. Simply visit thyca.org, click donate, and designate your gift for SYT. To learn more about us and the work we do, please visit saveyourthyroid.org. If you have any questions about any of this, don't hesitate to email me at saveyourthyroid at gmail.com. Any way you choose to support the podcast or the SYT community is sincerely appreciated. Your generous contribution keeps this work going and helps us to help more patients like me and you. Thank you so much for watching. And now back to the podcast. We maintain a list of physicians at our website, saveyourthyroid.org. And so we've got on, on the list, you know, your location and then a few other locations that are in um, Canada, I think in um, Montreal and Toronto. Um, do you know of any developments over in Western Canada? So this is one of the things like, I'm like, great, I brought it to Canada, but like, what is, what's going to happen now? Like, I'm only one person. I can't just be the right. only person doing everything. Um, and so I, I am trying to do a lot of <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I am trying to do a lot of them, but I think that's not that's not a, a sustainable model. Um, so when I first started, my plan was to do a bunch of courses, and I've actually run at two courses. Or we have another course uh, coming up just for Canadians, uh, Canadian practitioners to come. And we've had uh, we've had endocrinologists, we've had surgeons, we've had interventional radiologists all come to my course uh, in Toronto to train people to do this um, because you need you know I've I've done a bunch of um, I've brought a bunch of uh, a bunch of other uh, procedures to, to, to Canada. Like I'm the only mm -hmm. person doing the, the scarless thyroid surgery and stuff like that. And I'm still pushing to try and get other people to do it. I've trained fellows. I started a fellowship. So I have some fellows that have populated the Canadian landscape to some degree. So I think that's the key really is to train people yeah. uh, to do it and uh, really to set the standards of how to do it. Cause I think, you know, if you just let anyone do whatever they want, then you may not have, you may not have the right people getting the right treatment as we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been, as I said, I've been running courses and so I got to tell you, like, so we train, we're training people from Western Canada right now. Um, there's at least two to three programs in Western Canada starting up in the next few months for sure. Uh, definitely Bye. in Calgary. I know, I know in Edmonton, uh, they're going to be starting one and Vancouver for sure as well. Awesome. Uh, there may be one or two centers in Vancouver. So, um, yeah, so we're stay tuned for that. And I, I'm happy to keep you updated on the, yes. Um, <laughs> on the places for sure. Yeah, if you can send me that information when you become aware of the locations that are doing that, 
um, I will definitely want to put that on the list for the other patients that are in those areas. That, that's very exciting. So, <clears throat> well, going back, circling back to your program in Toronto. So what is the process for a patient if they want to come see you and establish a relationship with you and seek treatment for RFA? How do they go about doing that? That's a good question. Usually in Canada, usually referrals come from other physicians. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just basically have to have your doctor just send me the information. There is a, I have a website I can post it. We, we, one of my med students just kind of put it together just to try to get some sort of process for it. Um, and uh, so we'll, uh, we can, we can share that with you, but basically there's like a little uh, referral form that would help you know, make sure that all the information uh, comes to us that's necessary. Uh, and uh, usually if it's from someone from outside of Toronto, which I do a lot of patients, I see a lot of patients from outside of Toronto or outside of Ontario specifically, um, I usually have to review their imaging uh, before I can um, before I can decide that they can, they're an adequate candidate. Because a lot of people, you know, the reports, that's why I do my, that's another reason why I do my ultrasounds. The reports are often not reflective of mm -hmm. what is actually going on with your thyroid. And I think that's... Um, that's something that I need as somebody who's going to be performing uh, the treatment. I need to actually see myself. Uh, Most and all, definitely. Of the, all the surgeons I train, all my fellows, even the surgeons that work with me, we, we all have a, a very uh, clear uh, baseline that all of us do our own ultrasounds because it's really important to uh, to see the to see what you're, the disease you're trying to treat for sure. Definitely, yeah. That's a common issue we run into with patients who a lot of us, you know, don't have physicians in our local area who do RFA or any other thermal ablation. And so it's not uncommon to see patients traveling, you know, out of state, but when they do their local follow-up, sometimes they run into issues with their local doctor, you know, doesn't understand what they're looking at on ultrasound or the local radiologist doesn't understand how to interpret it. And so that's why I think it's so important to have this collaboration between physicians and specialties to make sure that everyone knows what's going on here. You know, this isn't suddenly this patient has developed a nasty case of thyroid cancer. It's actually a normal expected progression, you know, as the thyroid is changing after the ablation. So um, that's so it's, important. It's funny, that you, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've had a few discussions with my, even my radiology department um, mm -hmm. at my hospital about what some of the comments that the patients are getting from the technologists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I mean it's pretty, it's pretty I mean I can't imagine like you know if if you're if you're in there you've had an RFA your thyroid nodule is actually much smaller you're feeling great and mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know so, so one of the radiology technologists is saying oh my god you got a bad thyroid cancer like go see your doctor tomorrow like you, you got to yeah. uh, so yeah I mean I I'm very clear about talking to patients about that but even then like you know it's still hard because um, you know I'm not standing there with them when they have that information so. Yeah, I think that's really important, and the advocacy for that is is has been big. I, whenever I give talks for uh, for surgeons or endocrinologists or radiologists, I'm always really clear about that, and that's like a big part of the course too, to try to make sure that we set expectations for patients and for uh, practitioners, because we um, we have a, again the same scenario where patients can go anywhere to get an ultrasound, and uh, and they may not have even heard of our favorite before for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the types of thyroid nodules you're treating. You've already mentioned that you're doing a cancer trial and I want to dive into that a little bit in just a second, but let's start with types of benign nodules and then move into cancer after that. Yeah. So I think the, there's really two clinical indications for, for RFA right now, at least in our jurisdiction. Uh, the first is large or symptomatic, usually large benign thyroid nodules. Um, you know, benign uh, is is hard because again, the variability of of, of uh, cytology is is rampant, especially in Canada. Like, there's a study that was published in a hospital across the street from mine showing that their AUS uh, ATP of undetermined significance, which is uh, indeterminate, as you know, but but maybe the listeners um, may not may not be aware. But it's it's, a, it's a basically an indeterminate nodule. We don't know if it's thyroid cancer or, or right. benign. Those rates are up to 50% in their patients, whereas in our center, it's probably less than 10%. So the Bethesda says it should be between 5 and 15%. And, uh, and so there's variability in the calls that pathologists are making. Um, hopefully, like, you know, with the initiation of other, you know, AI and other things, we can kind of help bridge that gap a little bit. And molecular testing obviously is helpful, but in Canada, it's not as helpful for us because it's not usually covered by the, um, the provincial health insurance plans. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's why you know, it's really important to make sure that this is benign from your, the way that you decide. And if that's two benign biopsies, or if that's a very low risk, 
lesion on ultrasound plus a benign biopsy, that might be reasonable too. Um, but anyways, a benign nodule nonetheless that's causing symptoms. And as I said, like not necessarily large because I do have small thyroid nodules protect, um, most usually on the isthmus in the center of the thyroid, which are pushing out of the center of the neck. Uh, those often cause symptoms, uh, but mm -hmm. they're maybe small, a couple centimeters or less. So I think it really depends on uh, the symptomology of the lesion. And it depends on the fact that you're, you're fairly certain it's benign. Now, it, 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 like there may be a, a small less than 1% of chance that you're going to have, um, you're going to have a, a, a cancer that you've, you've ablated. And I'm sure that that's, that's something that a lot of people are concerned about, but I think it's really important. Uh, I think for the patient that's had an RFA to, you know, be aware that that's a tiny risk. Um, but I think, you know, but we, we have ability to monitor these things. And, um, and so you may not look at the, the tyrads of the nodule because that's going to change dramatically after RFA. But you may look at the lymph nodes in this in the um, uh, in the side of the neck. You may look at the, uh, the the growth, the regrowth of the nodule. So there there's a lot of different ways to to kind of uh, to, to facilitate understanding if this is a nodule that's that's concerning or not. Um, but I think certainly like we have very uh, good ways now of at least risk stratifying thyroid nodules to make sure. They're but anyways, that's the benign side then symptomatic side and symptomatic side really patients do really well. And the data is actually the best for this specific indication. So the indication that a thyroid nodule is symptomatic uh, to get RFA, the data internationally, both in the U S and overseas, Korea, Europe, a uh, lot of really, really good data showing that patients both have decreased in the size of their nodule on average. Some of the studies show about 70% and also it's better quality of life and symptomology. And that's probably the most important part. And mm -hmm. I think that's really to be able to get uh, an in-office procedure that takes, you know, maybe up to an hour, but really you go home a few minutes later and, um, and you're feeling fine, uh, uh, you know, really soon after. I think that's really dramatically the, the, the best part of, of RFA. Um, totally. You know, I had a patient that had, uh, they had RFA one day and then they actually flew to New York for a, for a, for a get together that night. And, uh, wow. it's not, it's not a long flight from Toronto, New York, but like, that's like patients are, can do that. You can't do that after taking out your thyroid from surgery. So, mm -hmm. uh, really important. so that was the first indication, uh, benign symptomatic nodules. Second indication would be for, um, for hot nodules. And the best data is for single hot nodules. Uh, many patients uh, have high th thyroid or hyperthyroidism from other causes. So there's really two main causes of hyperthyroidism that we treat uh, specifically in, in endocrine surgery. The first is related to, there's other very rare types, but I'll just talk about the broad two large types. First is related to Graves disease, which is, as you know, an autoimmune disease. And that really hasn't been shown to be helpfully treated by RFA. Um, I wrote a small uh, paper on um, in clinical thyroidology on Graves treatment of RFA. And there are some studies published mostly from East Asia showing that uh, in very small percentage of patients, they can have um, some relief from our, using RFA uh, after multiple different rounds of other types of treatments. But it's really not that great in terms of the data. Yeah. The data is really the best for single hot nodules. And, uh, and many patients have hot nodules, but there's many of them. And uh, those patients actually um, may not benefit from RFA, specifically if they're all throughout the thyroid. Um, so often those patients I'll offer surgery to if they want definitive therapy, um, or if they're just small nodules, they're not causing any problems. Some people will give reactive iodine. So those would be definitive therapy. Um, non-definitive therapy, as you know, is, is antithyroid medication. So again, um, hot nodules that are single hot nodules is the other main indication for, uh, for RFA. Mm -hmm. And then you want to talk about cancer because the very, very common conversation we're having today with the patients in our community is when is this appropriate for thyroid cancer? Because so many patients will come in the group and they'll say, well, we ha I have, I have a five centimeter thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer. Could I have RFA? And I would love for you to explain to them why that is generally not an appropriate treatment for them. Okay. So thyroid cancer is, uh, is a variable. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a disease that has a lot of different um, types of, uh, right. of uh, outcomes. Uh, and so we risk stratify thyroid cancer to kind of low risk or very low risk thyroid cancer, intermediate thyroid cancer and high risk thyroid cancer. Now the, the as everyone knows, you know, cancer is, uh, is related to the genetics of the cell. 
Um, some of that might be uh, genetics related to your hereditary uh, genetics passed on by your family, or maybe related to the genetics that the cells just adapted based on your the environment. So you know many different things, and we can get into that at some point in the future as well. But but basically, thyroid cancer is a genetic problem that causes the cells to replicate uh, without um, having some stop gaps. And in general, the majority of thyroid cancer is what we call low risk or very low risk thyroid cancer. And you can see that in very clear data sets, uh, which, uh, which when you think about low risk thyroid cancer, most low risk thyroid cancer does not cause any problems um, over the course of your life. In fact, even without treatment, it may not cause problems. And we see this in autopsy studies of patients that have died for reasons unrelated to their thyroid, maybe from heart disease or something else. And they look at their thyroid on autopsy and they find thyroid cancer is up to 30% or more of the time. So that mm -hmm. means that like, there's many, many patients that have thyroid cancers in their neck that are not causing any problems. And um, we see that in when you institute an ultrasound screening program where you're looking at thyroids without actually having a reason to, you find a lot of thyroid cancers. Right. So, so that led to an increase, a dramatic increase in the rates of thyroid cancer in North America and elsewhere over the last, uh, over the last years. Um, but over the course of the last kind of few years, we've kind of got a, honed in a little bit on this and understood, you know, trying to decrease the amount of treatment. Now, the problem was that up until about 10, 15 years ago, when a physician found a thyroid cancer, the treatment was what I call the big three, which is total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine, and thyroid suppression for life. And we've, uh, we've seen uh, data, uh, large data sets of patients that have had thyroid cancer in treated variable, in variable ways. We've seen large data sets show that that's probably not great. And when you think about the, the, the side effects of taking out your thyroid yeah. um, and radioactive iodine and thyroid suppression, uh, compared to a small thyroid cancer that we see in 30% of people that have died for reasons unrelated to their thyroid, we kind of pause and say, okay, why should we be doing this big, th big surgery and therapies for small lower thyroid cancers? Um, this is not for the intermediate and high risk thyroid cancer. I'll talk about this in a second, but low risk thyroid cancers, I think are, and I think the, 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 the surgical and medical community agrees that we over treat these cancers and we still unfortunately are over treating them in many jurisdictions in the world, including mm -hmm. North America, U S and Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, there's been a couple steps to try and decrease some of this. Uh, the first has been to adopt some of the uh, Japanese data, which shows that we can actually watch small thyroid cancers. And they actually saw that uh, they, they looked at, uh, they've been looking at thyroid cancers that were one centimeter or less for decades. And they found that the risk of the thyroid cancer spreading to let's say a lymph node, a lateral lymph node, over the course of three, two, three decades is probably about five or 6%. Like, so let's say around 5%. When you look back at some of those data sets showing that patients that were treated for low risk thyroid cancer with total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine and thyroid suppression, those patients had a recurrence rate of around 5%. Wow. So if you think to yourself, you have recurrence rates of 5% for dramatic treatment, and recurrence or, or de novo lymph node metastasis rate requiring surgery for, uh, for patients that were active sur surveilled of about 5%, there must be some, something in the middle that we're not, we're not, we're not treating the right thing. And there's, um, there's a surgeon uh, in New York, uh, who always would talk, uh, Ashok Shah would also talk, also always talk about how the punishment should fit the crime. We should always be, we should be treating a cancer with what, what, what is the adequate treatment and not those patients to uh, to, uh, side effects when yeah. they don't need to. But on the other hand, we have to understand the, the risk of thyroid cancer spreading and causing problems in the future. And that is something that we need to take, take into consideration. Um, and that's obviously a risk too. people, uh, people have, uh, things that happen to them, um, uh, happen to their thyroid cancer. They may come back and they may spread. And that's definitely something to think about. Mm -hmm. We have to really think about the, 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 the differences. So, so in my, so, uh, when I first, uh, came, uh, came to Toronto, like over 10 years ago, we, we actually, uh, I would actually be involved with, um, with an active surveillance program for, uh, lesions that were two centimeters or under two centimeters in size. This is probably the upper end of the, the, the size of the thyroid cancer that, that we're treating, um, and uh, and uh, the organizers of this uh, of this trial and Sock and Dave Goldstein, they actually have organized it to go across the, the country. Um, so we have a lot of centers across the country, and that's been really really successful. And patients 
quality of life is, is good and patients do not have a lot of decision regret for, for treating their thyroid cancer with active surveillance. Now, mm -hmm. the problem is that in many jurisdictions, it's hard to convince patients to get active surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually harder to convince their doctors to convince them to get active surveillance. And I think that is the dramatic change in the way that we treat thyroid cancer uh, from a surgical perspective and, and radiation oncology perspective and, else, and other, other ways of treating it to an active surveillance has been a very fast, dramatic shift. Um, you know, in 2009, uh, the recommendation for most thyroid cancers was to treat with, with total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine. And in 2015, they're already talking about active surveillance for lesions less than one centimeter in the American Thyroid Association guidelines. So to have, you know, in less than a decade, a dramatic shift in the way yeah. that we've been treating thyroid cancer for decades and decades and decades, I think is really hard to kind of conceptualize in the medical community. So, yeah. so at least from my perspective, I think RFA is a great bridge uh, for that. Uh, and it's not that you're basically, you know, treating this thyroid cancer and like sending the patient off uh, to not worry about it ever again. And that's why I started this trial to try to see if we can actually uh, provide some uh, some guideline, some su suggestion on how to treat patients. Obviously, we have to know that it is safe, it's effective, and it okay. also um, uh, it also uh, is, is good for quality of life and also good from the oncology side. Um, and that's why we're doing this trial. There's other trials being being performed throughout the country and internationally. But on the other side, you know, it, it just it, it's it's more palatable at least now for for patients and mostly for physicians. <laughs> that's kind of what I say on the side. Like physicians are the ones that we have to actually uh, be more uh, be more aggressive in terms of uh, sort of explaining this to them. Uh, you know, patients that have low risk thyroid cancers probably can tr be treated that way. Um, so that's kind of how I how I conceptualize in my mind. Now the 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 treatment that we do specifically is to make sure that we ablate the entire uh, nodule with at least a small uh, a small margin. Um, I think the margin depends on the location of the tumor. Right. I've done thyroid cancers that have been relatively close to what we call the danger triangle, which is where the recurrent nerve. Uh, goes. And I think it depends on if you think you can actually hydrodissect and push that nodule away from the area. Uh, uh, I had a patient that had a thyroid cancer that was really basically right on the trachea. And I think that would be a patient that I would rather have surgery for. So I think it really depends on the patient's uh, thyroid cancer, where it's located, uh, how big it is. Our trials for two centimeters or less um, and it's only for, unfortunately, I know you have a listener, a listening group in the U.S., uh, but unfortunately, our trial is only for local people because we do follow them quite uh, mm -hmm. quite considerably. We just don't have the the um, the funding and the uh, the resources to do uh, to expand this trial currently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am talking to some colleagues in the U.S. and, and over uh, over the and, uh, across Canada to try to expand this trial um, uh, if we get some funding and if we get some. Um, uh, some support. So, so that's kind of the idea is that, is that you really have to kind of have a, a subspecialty understanding of where the thyroid cancer is and what the risks are and benefits and, and those kinds of things. But I think, I think thyroid cancer treatment, especially low, low risk, small thyroid cancers, um, which could be treated with active surveillance and uh, may be treated with, um, with RFA. Now, so I'll just close with one thing about data. So mm -hmm. the data is actually quite uh, good for active surveillance, as I was talking about before. Um, Akira Mayuchi, who's the uh, who's the professor in, in Kobe, Japan, who uh, popularized uh, active surveillance, he's published some data showing that his the best patients that, for active surveillance may be a bit of the, some of the older patients, not necessarily old, but older, like maybe like you know over over fifty or over sixty. I don't, I don't remember exactly what his cutoff was. Whereas some of the papers coming from uh, from East Asia, East Asia show that RFA may be better for younger patients, and the reason is because in uh, Mayuchi's trials. A lot of the patients that fell out of the trial were not because they had cancer that that came back or that that grew. Uh, a lot of patients were just worried about it, and I think that's a completely reasonable thing yeah. to have when you have a small thyroid cancer in your neck. You're worried about it every six months or three months, you know, a year. You're getting an ultrasound and you're worried yeah. about it. What, is, did it grow? Did what happened to it? So I think the treatment of that uh, potentially RFA would be is is helpful both mostly for the quality of life. Uh, perhaps on the oncology side. Uh, wow, and that's only for papillary cancers, right? That's a good question because the idea would be to have a molecular test, mm -hmm. um, which which would tell us that this is uh, a worrisome thyroid cancer that's a high risk, 
even though it's small. And we do have small thyroid cancers that spread to lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important before you're ever considering a non-surgical, non-radioactive iodine uh, option to make sure that it's a localized, small, what we call low-risk thyroid cancer from the get-go. But, but I think um, the, the idea would be, as, as we were talking about how genetics really plays the key, the biology is the key of this tumor, um, it would be ideal to have like a test that you run on this thyroid cancer when you first find it and say, you know what, this is a cancer that really is going to spread. We need to do total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine, thyroid suppression for the rest of your life. Um, whereas uh, if, you did, if the test says, no, this is not going to cause problems and you can do surveillance or potentially RFA. So that's kind of the holy grail. Unfortunately, we're not at that point yet uh, uh, in the thyroid community. Uh, the data is not, is not supportive of that quite yet, although there are some, uh, and I think you have on your, on your trial, on your uh, podcast, you've had uh, people talking about some of the new technologies available, and those are really exciting to see what, what happens with those. Um, so, so I think, you know, that would be the ideal. So again, papillary cancer, low risk uh, thyroid cancer, that's a uh, well differentiated thyroid cancer, papillary follicular. Um, it's hard for us to tell uh, before we have surgery um, uh, or not what, what the actual final pathology is, but uh, mm -hmm. well differentiated thyroid cancer is what we, is what we treat. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a, like a biopsy result that would determine what exactly the, the contents of the nodule are, whether it's benign or papillary thyroid cancer, right? Exactly. Yeah. And we are, we, we do have an arm of our trial for indeterminate thyroid nodules as okay. well. Um, but there are, you know, active surveillance trials that, that include indeterminate nodules as well, considering that some of them are benign. So they'll probably lower mm -hmm. the, um, they may even dilute out some of the worrisome features of some, some of these thyroid cancers, because some of them will be benign. So I think, I think, uh, indeterminate thyroid nodules are reasonable to, to, to do as well. Um, just from the, from the amount of follow-up that is required many times. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, I did a paper looking at Ontario data. We have 16 mm -hmm. million people living in Ontario, Ontario's the largest wow. province in Canada. And, uh, and I looked over the course of 20 years, uh, over, I think it was over 150,000 thyroid biopsies that were not cancer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, many of them, almost all of them had repeat biopsies over many, many years. Mm -hmm. Some patients had 17 more biopsies. Wow. Um, and, and I, and I gotta tell you, like, you know, I look at these data and I'm like, you know what, it's, it's shocking, but I'm sure it's actually happening. And uh, some people are getting biopsies every year, like all these things. Mm. So I, I really, um, I, 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 that's one of my other kind of sides is that we really over investigate the nodules considering that even the worst case scenario, it's a lower thyroid cancer. What is the treatment? Um, so yeah. somebody getting like multiple biopsies, I know some people are do, doing biopsies without uh, local, I, I use local for my biopsies, but you know, if to get a biopsy every year, uh, yeah. without local, um, it's really like that, that hardship compared to what the worst case scenario of a low risk thyroid cancer would be, um, is really a difficult thing to stomach. Right. So anyways, getting back to your initial question, I'm sorry, I, uh, no, I digress, okay. but a, a, a four or five centimeter thyroid cancer would be considered according to the ATA guideline, an intermediate risk thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. So intermediate risk thyroid cancer uh, is not what we're talking about of these low risk thyroid cancers that have very low uh, um, recurrence mm -hmm. uh, rates. Um, their recurrence rates can be higher, 15% or higher. Mm -hmm. And so those types of uh, thyroid cancers can uh, are usually treated with, as I said, like the total thyroidectomy and or radioactive iodine and or um, uh, thyroid suppression. So it depends on the risk stratification, both pre-op and post-op once they get a bit of an understanding of the, of the thyroid biology, thyroid cancer biology, um, to, uh, to decide what to do afterwards. But I think that that's not what we're talking about for mm -hmm. these types of cancers. Um, uh, and I hope, I hope that that kind of makes it a bit clearer because yeah. I think that I do get a lot of referrals as well for patients that do have thyroid cancers that should be treated. And I say, you know, go, do you have an excellent surgeon there? Go see that surgeon uh, mm -hmm. to take it out. And, uh, Oftentimes, these, these thyroid cancers can be treated with partial thyroidectomy, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important. Some of the data has been shown that, you know, we pick four centimeters as a cutoff, um, but that four centimeters may not be, um, may not be uh, uh, like that important when we think about the cancer biology. So as long as there's no local invasion or there's no worrisome pathology cells or there's no lymph, like substantial lymph node, clinical lymph adenopathy, so clinical lymph nodes, big lymph nodes, um, it may be reasonably treated with lobectomy and then followed. So I think that's really important discussion to have with you and your providers about, you know, how, uh, how to treat this. But I think the data is, changes rapidly and I think yeah. there's a big for de-escalation. Um, and this has been not over the last 
day or so. This has been like de-escalation over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And we're not seeing a, a profound increase in thyroid cancer death rates, at least not in Canada. And I'm, I haven't seen the data from the U.S., but I, I, see, I see that we haven't seen it. So that's a very reassuring sign that you know, de-escalation is actually probably beneficial for everybody. I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Qualashore Diagnostics, the developer of Thyroid Guide PX. Not all thyroid cancers need to be treated with extensive surgery. Thyroid Guide PX is a test that can determine if cancer is slow growing or aggressive. Knowing that you have a slow growing cancer may help you and your doctor to determine if observation, less extensive surgery, or thermal ablation might be right for you. If you would like to learn more about this test, please email admin at qualassuredx.com or visit their website, qualassuredx.com. A heartfelt thank you goes out to Qualashore Diagnostics for sponsoring this episode and supporting this channel. Now back to the podcast. I love the term de-escalation of thyroid cancer treatment because it's, it, as you were saying, the rates have gone up, but the survivorship has remained stable. And I think that's important that we, we don't over treat a disease that's not necessarily going to have a better outcome from that over treatment. So I think that's so great. And um, yes, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to understand too. I had a patient ask a question actually about, is there a situation where you would ever treat with RFA without doing a biopsy? And I think that, I know the answer, I'm going to let you answer in just a second, but I think it's important that you know what's contained within this nodule, because if you don't know what it is, you're going to have a harder time understanding what the appropriate treatment is. So would you answer that question for me? Is there ever a time where you would do an RFA without doing a biopsy? From a primary thyroid tumor, uh, no. I mean, think, I, I mean that that's exactly your point. Like, we, we really need to know mm -hmm. what, what's happening um, with that cell. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, thyroid biopsies are have their own problems, right? So uh, I think in a, in a situation where you're doing a thyroid biopsy in a center that may not see a lot of thyroid biopsies, um, then it's maybe more, you know, maybe the, the, the rates of, that you're seeing of the call that's being made by that biopsy may not be um, maybe as good as doing without a biopsy. But the problem is that we, you know, it's unfortunate, but like there are so many high volume thyroid centers, in, at least in the U.S. Um, and the unfortunate thing, and I looked at these U.S. data relatively recently, like most of the thyroid surgery is being done in non low non-high volume centers. And we have the same problem in Canada where the ge geography is very difficult to get to the places that are doing high volume. Uh, but I think in the U S you also have that added issue of, uh, of, um, uh, of insurance issues. So I think yeah. there's a lot of different reasons why pa patients can't get to the high volume centers. Um, but there are, there are some studies showing that patients drive past high volume centers to get to lower volume centers uh, as well. So, wow. so I think it's really, you know, the, these are things that I, you know, as a Canadian, I, Try not to delve into from the American uh, the American <laughs> side, but but certainly in Canada, I'm working on some of these issues in terms of accessibility to mm -hmm. try to get to centers that actually see a lot of thyroid biopsies, um, because you wouldn't want like an a electrician fixing your your lights that has, has never done you know never seen uh, the light light fixture that you have before mm -hmm. or the way that your lights are set up in your in, the wires are set up in your house. So you wouldn't want that. Um, obviously, people have to learn, and so you have teaching centers that help you know transition right. people people to practice. But I think, you know, from a, from a team perspective, we have a lot of data showing that, especially in complex cancers, uh, treatment at a high volume center uh, is way better. And we, we have, we, the, the, the good thing about Canada is that we have a health policy um, ability to centralize certain types of, uh, of cancer care. For example, pancreas cancer can only be done in a few hospitals in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Lung cancer can only be done in a few hospitals in Ontario. So we have that kind of uh, that kind of centralization, and, and I know that it's it's hard to do, and it's even hard to do in Canada uh, for non uh, non you know morbid or or mortal cancers like thyroid cancer that don't kill people. But um, but I think in the U.S. you actually are making headway, and it's what is what I've what I've seen at least. But yeah, that's the, that's the issue is that you just you just don't know. So biopsy. Yeah. Getting back to your question, biopsy is definitely necessary before we uh, before we do. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and do you, do you typically re recommend two biopsies or one, or does it depend on the situation? So I think what your question is talking about is, is large or symptomatic thyroid nodules before 
uh, RFA. Mm -hmm. So if it's a very low risk uh, thyroid nodule um, on uh, on ultrasound, I'll usually just do one benign biopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if there's a reasonable cystic component, um, then you can't even get a benign biopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it looks most mostly benign to me, uh, it, and I'll usually I'll usually present it at our uh, at our RFA rounds to or have an opinion from the other uh, RFA uh, or uh, endocrine, thir endocrine surgeons that treat a lot of thyroid nodules. Um, then uh, then I'll just do it without without that, but um, without the second biopsy. But yeah, traditionally, uh, many of the recommendations are two benign biopsies um, mm -hmm. uh, before RFA is completed. Mm -hmm. um, molecular tests also plays in a role there, and I know that some people mm -hmm. can get molecular testing. And so if you have a molecular test that shows that it's uh, low risk, then that's, uh, that probably supersedes your benign biopsies anyways. There's a question in here from a patient asking, would you biopsy a one centimeter nodule with vague symptoms? And I guess it would depend upon what the nodule looks like on ultrasound. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the recommendation from the American Thyroid Association is not biopsy lesions under one centimeter. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's just because we see so many of these thyroid cancers uh yeah. that are you know, undescript and and you know and it's better not to know i guess is what the medical community says mm -hmm. um because once you biopsy especially if you live in a in a jurisdiction where you know there's issues related to like treatment and you need to you, need, you have like standards of care and stuff like that in certain jurisdictions mm -hmm. um you know you may you may put yourself in as a, in a situation where you don't want to be as a, as a clinician um so I think that's kind of the that's kind of the issue is like I wouldn't biopsy if it didn't make criteria if it was symptomatic, especially mm -hmm. if it's in the center of the neck, as I said mm -hmm. before, um, then that would depend on the nodule, uh, the way the nodule looked. If it was like a very cyst, it was like a cyst, then then it doesn't need a biopsy um, mm -hmm. in, in most most case scenario because cysts, even if you try to biopsy, they come back as non diagnostic, which usually leads to more worry from right. every party. <laughs> So I think it really depends on, on, you know, somebody that knows the thyroid nodule consistency and mm -hmm. understand what it looks like. Well, I want to circle back. You said something about standards of care and, and being consistent across different, you know, with patient care. One of the patients asked this question that that was very interesting. She says, is there a governing body in Canada responsible for ongoing physician education and or standardized patient care that includes presentation of all available treatment options for thyroid nodules. And I think this question comes from the fact that so many patients, they find out they have a thyroid nodule and they're told your only option is to either watch it or have thyroid surgery. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of things about that question. The first is mm -hmm. the indication for RFA and, um, and having a thyroid nodule is not really an indication for RFA. It mm -hmm. really needs to be symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And I do get a lot of referrals for some, for non asymptomatic thyroid nodules, mm -hmm. just RFA cause I don't want it. Um, and we know that thyroid nodules are so common. 50% of people have thyroid nodules, probably more as we get older, more of us have thyroid nodules. So mm -hmm. literally like, almost everybody has a thyroid nodule uh, around you probably at any given time. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't really need to um, treat them uh, in the, for the, many of them, most of them, <laughs> for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I think that's the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of the question is, uh, is, um, is education of, of physicians and definitely like uh, the Royal College uh, of um, Physicians and Surgeons of Canada actually has a mandatory uh, ongoing uh, continuing medical education uh, requirement to fulfill uh, over their career. And uh, the College of Family Physicians has that for family docs. So we have that in the US, you have the American College of Surgeons that does that. Um, and so there is this, this, this uh, uh, maintenance of competency kind of part to all of our, uh, all of our uh, practices. Standard of care though is a bit different and that mm -hmm. is based on the yeah. jurisdiction. Um, and so, you know, it's a bit more tricky and probably a bit more nuanced and it, especially if you don't have it available, like if there's nobody doing RFA right. in that area, there's no ability to get the RFA probes or whatever, mm -hmm. um, then, then that's, can't be part of the standard of care. Right. So, um, we have patients that live in areas in Canada, which it takes, you know, you have to do three different modes of transportation. Like you have to do car, yeah. plane, helicopter to get to, and sometimes you can't even get to them parts of the year. 
Um, wow. So they're probably not they're probably not going to have access to some of this stuff, and I think that's just that's just part of the healthcare system that we live in, which is so heterogeneous. But but I think overall, absolutely, I think that when we have new technologies available in uh, in both the U.S. and Canada, we really have to figure out ways to push uh, the limits of, of education. Uh, and um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, even if you're talking about parathyroid, like I, I mean, it's not really to thyroid, but parathyroid, you know, we just, we have a paper coming out showing that we presented it at the American uh, Association of Endocrine Surgery, showing that, you know, in Canada, at least in Ontario, parathyroidectomy for patients with primary hyperparathyroidism is, tr is tremendously undertreated. And, uh, you know, we have rates, which are really, you know, embarrassing to say, but like, you know, under 20% of patients that should get surgery, get surgery in the wow. US. We have actually, it's close to maybe closer to 10%, maybe 10 or 15%. In the US, you know, some of the best data is about 30 to 40% in some centers. So it's still very low in the US. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of helped us push some of the, the discussion and some of the education pathways for mostly for physicians to say, you know what, if you see a high calcium, even if it's mildly elevated, that needs to be further worked up. That needs to be considered for surgery because those patients may benefit. Um, and the reason is because this paper shows that you only need to do, uh, you know, 22 or 23 parathyroidectomies to prevent one fracture. Um, so, that, so this is like a very small and uh, small thing to do to prevent, you know, very, very bad outcomes. And uh, fractures really, as you know, is quite, quite, uh, quite morbid and, and very. Uh, it definitely impacts quality life, patients' so. quality of life. So I, mean, I think that that's kind of what we see in in, uh, in in the whole endocrine surgery landscape is that you know we really are under treating this stuff because some of the times they're so common that there just there's just no resource available to treat it or there's lack of kind of uh, like a pathway when they have this that when you have a, a finding of this we should tr try this standard of care comments you were making about access I, that is a part of this that I hadn't really thought about with with regards to thermal ablation, the fact that if it's not available, it can't be standard of care. And that's kind of disappointing because, you know, we've seen actually this huge increase in the last four and a half years of thermal ablation providers in the United States and across the globe. And, and it's, it's, even though patients are still frustrated that it's not available everywhere, the growth has been exponential and we're so excited by that, but it's not everywhere yet you know, as you're saying. And so it can't be standard of care until it is, I guess. And so we'll just have to keep hoping and praying that it continues to grow and spread. And I, I'm really thankful for the work you're doing that is assisting with that. So you talked about RFA indications. What about the, um, what is your opinion of RFA for a multi-nodular goiter? Maybe particularly in the case of nodules that a few of the nodules are more dominant while some of them maybe aren't. Yeah, I mean, I think that it really depends on, uh, again, symptoms. So, so multi-nodular goiter would be for symptomatic thyroid nodules. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, I, I have done RFAs for patients that have multiple multi-nodular goiters, but usually in those scenarios, there's really a dominant side. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's the left side because that's where the esophagus runs. So your esophagus, which is the tube that you eat, eat that goes, they takes the food from the mouth down to the stomach. Mm -hmm. um, it actually runs on the left side in the neck, and then it actually moves to the right side in the chest. So, uh, so that's why people that have very large uh, left-sided thyroid nodules and maybe little small thyroid nodules on the right side. I would consider uh, doing a th uh, an RFA ablation on them because uh, I, I could consider that their symptoms are related to their large thyroid. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it really depends on you know how it looks. Uh, I, I very often patients have huge thyroids, both sides, sometimes going to the chest. I often say you know RFA is not for you. Um, thyroid surgery is actually the best option. Mm -hmm. And most thyroid surgeons can get your thyroid out without making the cut in the breastbone. Sometimes if the thyroid goes below the, uh, what we call the, the, the concavity of the aortic arch, basically below where the aorta kind of turns, um, uh, turns towards the side. Um, it, it usually needs us to cut the breastbone, but very mm -hmm. often, uh, patients can, can have just a neck incision and they're both thyroid out and patients feel really, really good after. And then oftentimes, uh, this thyroid is actually coming around the trachea and yeah. that's the cause of the symptoms. Uh, so, so taking out the thyroid in those patients is completely reasonable. In fact, I'm a surgeon, so I, I do that very mm -hmm. nice, uh, often. Um, and I think that's really uh, important to have somebody that knows the, uh, 
that knows that the outcomes from thyroid surgery and the outcomes from RFA that can help you make help the patients make a decision on what the best treatment is. But I often have people people that come for an RFA consult and they end up having surgery because I just you know we, we discussed that you know thyroid uh, RFA really just not going to help, um, and I don't I don't want to waste time, money, and everything like that to, to do something that will not going to help um, uh, when you have thyroid surgery that, again, as I said, has been, along for, been around for like 100 mm-hmm. plus years. Right. Uh, the way that we do. Well, what about a repeated treatment? What would, what would you say about a patient who either has a large nodule that needs maybe multiple sessions or a hot nodule that's, it, it's still producing hormones after treatment? Is there an indication for a repeat treatment ever? Yeah, so um, I think repeat treatment is something that usually can be uh, can be predicted mm. uh, before the first treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, if you have a very large nodule, and I have had patients with that, mm-hmm. we talk about how you know we'll do this, see how it works over the next nine to twelve months. Uh, if the symptoms are gone, but the nodule's still there, who cares? Like uh, this is completely a reasonable outcome. This is actually a great outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're not looking to get rid of the nodule 100%. Uh, we're looking to uh, to uh, to fix the symptoms that you're having mm-hmm. without doing surgery and without causing hypothyroidism. Like this is like the best best option. So so if you if you actually do that and you get rid of the symptoms, perfect. If you have a big nodule that you, that is still causing symptoms, then I think it's completely reasonable to uh, to talk about retreatment. But in those scenarios, again, like if they're really, really big, I'll try to talk about surgery. And if people are really set against it, then I'll talk about maybe one or two uh, treatment Mm -hmm. uh, pathways. Uh, The problem is that once you get into like more than that, um, you start worrying about the fact that maybe this is the wrong diagnosis uh, and your thyroid nodule is not benign. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that is something that that clinicians really need to consider. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is that uh, even if you do, there's some nodules that really take the energy really well and, uh, and shrink and some nodules, they take the energy and they just don't shrink as well, as much as they should, or Mm -hmm. that much as we expect them to do. And in that scenario, if you have symptoms, then perfect, uh, perfect candidate for surgical management to take out that, that large thyroid nodule. Mm -hmm. Um, When you talk about hot thyroid nodules, um, I think the same thing applies. Uh, The data is not that great. when we talk about large hot thyroid nodules yeah. um, and uh, and so the, the data shows about half the patients have normal thyroid functions um, within one year. I think that's partially related to selection bias. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a really good thyroid uptake scan that mm-hmm. shows that the thyroid nodule is the only hot place of the, of the, uh, of the production of thyroid hormone mm-hmm. uh, and you ablate that, I think you really have a good result. And I've seen that even in large nodules uh, in my practice, uh, but really, I think that's the consideration of saying, okay, maybe this is not a single hot right. nodule if you're having persistent disease. Maybe there's other hot areas in the thyroid, in mm-hmm. which case RFA is probably not the best option, which we talked about earlier. In the, in the mm-hmm. And I had a, another question on here about Hashimoto's nodules. This patient asks, is it better to do complete thyroid removal in order to avoid multiple procedures over your lifetime? Or to start with RFA and then be followed by a partial or full thyroid removal later. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, this is for Hashimoto's or for symptomatic thyroid nodules? This is for, for a patient who has Hashimoto's and thyroid nodules. And I think the question yeah. was, was, was pertaining to the fact that they think that maybe removing the gland will eliminate the autoimmune disease. And I, what I... In, my understanding is that just because you remove the gland, it doesn't remove the autoimmune attack. So we don't we don't have data, you know. As you know, like I'm an academic surgeon, so I like to kind of use data of to, to to support, right? Just to talk about, and and it's possible that these things are the case. It's possible that the Hashimoto's uh, is is part of the thyroid, but the data there was there was an initial paper a few years ago from Northern Europe showing that patients' quality of life was better after total thyroidectomy for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But that hasn't really been proven in large, large studies that I'm aware of. And okay. I'm happy to see new data sets as they come. And I, I exactly, and I think, you know, as somebody who tries to push limits, I love new data sets to try and uh, to try and change the way that we kind of think about things. But, but I think there's no, there's not a lot of data, at least for now, especially in like, you know, patients that have just have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's that, that, that surgical management is actually going to be very helpful, especially considering surgical management does have its own risks uh, as well. So an RFA has not, as that I'm aware of, has not been shown in a trial to affect the, uh, the outcomes of patients with Hashimoto's in patients that have Hashimoto's, but thyroid nodules that are symptomatic. I think the Hashimoto's plays into it from this perspective, which is 
when you uh, have Hashimoto's, you have more, more likely need for thyroid hormone replacement or supplementation. Uh, RFA is often done instead of surgery to prevent the need for thyroid hormone replacement. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have multiple thyroid nodules uh, and you're kind of sitting on the fence of saying RFA may not be helpful and you're already taking thyroid hormone, I think that might be a completely reasonable reason to take uh, to take out that part of the thyroid. So, mm -hmm. so I think it plays into consideration from that perspective. But mm -hmm. I think overall, I personally don't treat Hashimoto's and it's not at least what I consider an indication for RFA uh, currently. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly I'm happy and open to looking at data to try to change the, the indications for sure. Mm -hmm. and this is one thing I didn't touch on when we were talking about cancer earlier, but what do you think about RFA for recurrent cancer in a lymph node after a thyroidectomy? That's a great question. In fact, I think that this is something that is uh, is talked about a lot, but is actually not done very much because it's not the indications specifically are not uh, are not very common. Um, if somebody has a recurrence of thyroid cancer, let's say they had a thyroidectomy, they have a recurrence in their lateral neck. The, the, the standard treatment that I'm aware of based on data is to actually do a, a, um, a multi-level. Basically, you want to take the, the area of the thyroid cancer around the thyroid cancer itself, often because there's many different thyroid cancer, there are many other thyroid cancer lymph nodes, usually around that thyroid cancer nodule that's visible. So usually we do what we call lateral neck dissection, which we take the different levels of the neck around that thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give radioactive iodine to try and uh, treat those thyroid cancer cells that maybe have not been taken. Now, RFA plays into it after that scenario. So if you have a recurrent thyroid cancer in that operative field, then it might be a reasonable option to do thyroid cancer ablation. It may also be reasonable to do surgery. So it depends on what the thyroid cancer looked like how fast it's growing, um, what the thyroid cancer doubling time is, the thyroid globin doubling time is looking at the rest of the body mm -hmm. um, and and understanding like what the situation is. I did uh, The last thyroid cancer um, uh, le neck node that I did RFA on was a patient that had a symptomatic uh, thyroid cancer recurrence in a previously operated and radiated field. Mm. Uh, so they had radiation and surgery multiple times. Wow. And it was causing symptoms. It was causing pain just mm. under the jaw. Yeah. And, um, and we ablated it and actually she has no pain now. So I think that's like a very, uh, you know, these are small, you know, you can't use, you can't use those kinds of stories to generate uh, a recommendation. But I can say that, like, I think in those kinds of scenarios, it's likely to be the most benefit. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think if I'm a patient who's undergone multiple surgeries already and radiation, I'm looking to avoid that if I can again. So I think that's amazing when, when that can be offered. We have a patient asking, what is your advice to get Swedish clinics to start offering RFA? We see a lot of patients across the globe who they're so frustrated that it's not available in their country. So what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I'm happy to talk to stakeholders about how I got it to do, to do it in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things is that we were able to get it through something called MD SAP, which is a, a which is a, a authorization kind of a way of authorizing a, a, a new technology in a country. Um, so that applies not just to Canada, many other countries. It, the FDA does does the U.S., but it does have it does uh, suggest that you can do it in many other countries. And I'm happy to chat with them about how I set my program up and how I'm helping uh, populate the Canadian landscape for RFA. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly like, um, I'm happy to chat, but it, it is, it is difficult, especially, it's, you know, in, in, uh, in the Northern European countries, the health system again is even different than ours right. and different than the U S. And so I think a lot of it depends on health system roadblocks, which mm -hmm. are pushable, but you just need, you know, the drive and you need the, the, the time, um, yeah. even if you don't have it and you need, and you need the, you, need, you really want to, want to be a patient advocate. I think that's like the, where it comes down to. Um, you know, we, we easily could just do what we do and just do what the, what the people that taught us to do is and just like, you know, stick to ourselves and just continue on. But I think the, I think at least that's why, you know, I'm, I became an academic surgeon to try and like, you know, push limits and make sure that we can actually uh, offer patients, uh, better than what we did. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what we do for so many other things, just somehow in surgery, um, it just is a bit slower. And I think it's for good reason, right? You don't want to like start doing things that don't have any benefit and cause a lot of problems. Uh, but, but on the other hand, like it just, there, there is a lot of roadblocks and we just have to kind of just take them as they come in. And I'm happy to chat with the people in Sweden or wherever else in the world that are thinking about setting up their program. 
Well, that's amazing of you. And I, I think that it's important that we just keep talking about this. That's what the point of this podcast is, is, you know, we're, we're trying to spread the word and let people know, educate, how to educate themselves and, and how to spread the word even amongst physicians. You know, I, I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn and I'm so excited to see how countries across the globe are, you know, really working hard to pick this up and, and spread awareness and do training programs. You know, like I even spoke at a virtual conference in Kazakhstan. I mean, this is, this is wow. growing across the world and, and it just excites me tremendously. So I know we're out of time. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Pasternak, for answering all of these questions. You're quite a popular uh, person to ask questions to uh, from our Save Your Thyroid community. And it was just, it was so awesome to see several of the patients said to tell you hello. So you are, you are a, a very well-liked physician in our community. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I, I'm very, I'm very, you know, I, I really, I really appreciate you having me on. Like, I think these are, these are the kind of the ways that we can actually get hopefully like other physicians and yeah. other, you know, healthcare, uh, healthcare administrators see these kinds of things that say, you know what, we need to, you know, spend more uh, effort and resources on, on helping, uh, you know, make new technologies available. And, um, and, um, and, and thank you to, for you, Jen, to, for, for highlighting this. So I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening. Please share this content and help others. If you need resources, testimonials, and support, please join our patient community, Save Your Thyroid. You can also find me on social media and Substack under the media handle, It's Me, Jen Again. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own advocate and save your thyroid.